All right, we want to welcome everyone to our worship today. Thank you for being here. We appreciate the presence of everyone. Just a couple of things that I want us to keep in mind. Uh, our sister Harriet Garner passed away this past Thursday. Harriet was 99 years old. She was just two months away from her 100th birthday. So we certainly want to express our sympathy to her daughter Jane and to her son Charles. So please keep that family in your prayers. Also, uh, Nancy uh, will be scheduled for surgery this coming Tuesday. So I certainly want all of us to be lifting her up in our prayers that everything will go well uh, with her. But again, we are so thankful to have you here uh, today. And I'd like to read from Micah chapter 6. Verse 6 says, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? And then verse 8, he tells us, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And so as we come together to worship our Lord and to be edified and strengthened, I pray that we will leave with a sincere desire to do justice and to love kindness and to always walk humbly with our God. But again, we are blessed to be together to worship our Lord this morning. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and thank you for this time to come together to worship you. Father, we are so thankful for all that you have done for us. And we come to praise you, to adore you, to reverence you, to bow down before you. And I pray, Father, that you will be with each one of us and that we will worship you in spirit and in truth. And thank you for this time to be together. And again, Father, we do pray for, for Jane and for Charles that you'll be with and, and bless them in the loss of their mother. And that you also watch over and be with Nancy for her scheduled surgery this coming Tuesday. And we pray for its complete success. Continue with us throughout our time together this morning. And we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before His throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah! Shout hallelujah! Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. My Jesus. Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Savior.
leads us is now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. First off, let me say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers and all the spiritual fathers that are worshiping with us today. So we're in this series called A New Normal, a series that Andrew kicked off for us last week. And I want to begin our lesson by asking you a question. What are some things that irritate you? And no, I'm not asking that because it's Father's Day. just want you to think, what are some things that irritate you? So for me, a couple of things that irritate me. Uh, slow Wi-Fi is really, really frustrating. Waiting in a line, especially a really long line. And then probably one of my pet peeves is people that ride in the left lane on the interstate when they're not passing. That can be super frustrating. And these are mini crises, and every time you go through a mini crisis or any type of crisis, there is something that is true. A crisis reveals you. It reveals something about you. Maybe it reveals something about you that you don't really like, and it probably reveals something about you that other people don't really like. So last weekend, I was going through a personal crisis. Not going to share with you the details, but there was something that was going on. It was totally my fault. It was something that I created, and it was an issue that I was having. I was super anxious. I was getting frustrated. I was getting pretty irritable. And unfortunately, I was taking it out on those that were around me, and I was making other people uncomfortable. That crisis revealed something about me and the way that I handle crises. So in the midst of going through a crisis, you learn something about yourself. But the question is, do you like what you have learned about yourself? 
So maybe there's some things that you've recently learned given the crises that we've been going through. Maybe you learned that you really do enjoy being home more. Uh, maybe you learned that you really do miss your friends. I know for me, one of the things that I learned among those was that I really miss my routine because my whole routine got thrown off. But maybe there were some other things about yourself that you learned. Maybe you learned that you and your spouse don't have as strong of a relationship as you had really thought. Maybe you learned that you're not cut out to homeschool your children and that you're super thankful for school and that you're praying, as well as I am, that school starts back in August. Maybe you found out that you weren't as prepared financially for an emergency as you hoped you would be. And while it's true that a crisis will reveal you, it's also true that hopefully a crisis can reset you. So we all find ourselves hoping for life to go back to normal. But that's really hard because normal disappeared. And I know that can be sad to think about, but it can be an opportunity for our lives to be reset. I hope you understand that some of the things that were in your life before the disruption aren't really worth keeping. But maybe there are other things in your life that are worth keeping. It's kind of like a yard sale. You ever had a yard sale or a garage sale? You go through your house and you look at everything and you determine whether or not you're going to keep it. And whatever you choose to sell in the garage sale, well, it's going to leave the house. And one thing we know for sure is that whatever you put outside to be sold in the garage sale must never come back inside. But what's also weird is that some of the things that you're selling in this garage sale, you paid really good money for. Maybe you paid hundreds of dollars for it and now you're selling it for less than 10 isn't that crazy? But it just reminds us to think about some of the things that may be going on in our life, some of the things that may have been revealed through the, the different situations we've been dealing with. Maybe some of those things are not worth bringing back. So there's this interesting scene in the life of Israel that we pick up in Exodus chapter 16. Now, just to catch you up to what's going on in the life of Israel, they've been living in the land of Egypt as slaves for 400 years. And now they are going to be delivered. And God has led them out of the land of Egypt. He has conquered Pharaoh and the most powerful army and empire on the face of the planet at the time. He has led them through the Red Sea as he has parted the waters. And now they're on this uh, journey through the wilderness where they're going eventually to Mount Sinai to receive God's law. But along the way, they experience a crisis. And we pick that up in Exodus 16, starting in verse 2. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Why are they grumbling? They're grumbling because they're hangry. You ever gotten hangry? It's when you're hungry and you begin to get a little bit angry. I know it's happened to me many, many times. They're just getting hangry. They're hungry. They want something to eat. And so it says in verse 3 that the Israelites said to them, said to Moses and Aaron, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food that we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Wow. All right. So obviously this crisis revealed something about these people's hearts. It revealed that they had absolutely no faith in God. Just think about all the things that they had seen up until this point. They had experienced and witnessed all of the ten plagues. They had, ex they had witnessed God part the waters of the Red Sea. They can look up and see God's presence in this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire that's leading them all throughout this journey. And yet here they think that God is leading them out to starve to death. This crisis revealed that they had absolutely no faith in God. And it also revealed that their fear of true freedom led them to desire what was familiar. That's really one of the points that Andrew was making last week in his message, which if you haven't watched it, please go back and spend some time watching his message as he kicked off a new normal series. And in that message, he makes the point, when we don't know what's next, we long for what's familiar. And it's exactly what's happening in the life of Israel here. They preferred to go back to slavery simply because they had something to eat. It is revealing such a weakness within their hearts. And our crises are revealing other weaknesses in our hearts. Maybe one of the things that you've noticed about yourself is that this crisis has revealed a lack of patience in your life. Maybe it's revealed a lack of faith in God. 
or it's revealed a lack of faith in people or a lack of faith in the leaders that God has placed over you. Maybe this crisis has revealed an increase in anxiety in your life or a push for control or maybe a mentality that says, I'm just going to look out for me and take care of us. Maybe it's revealed this desire to make your crisis everyone else's crisis too. So there's this scene in the life of Jesus in Mark chapter 4. He and his disciples have gotten on this boat and they're sailing across the Sea of Galilee. Something that they've done many times and we know that some of his disciples were fishermen and it's something they've done hundreds if not thousands of times. But this time was a little bit different because in this scene there's a, a really big storm that comes upon them. And the Sea of Galilee sits in this bowl, so surrounded by mountains, and it was hard to know what the weather was going to be like. They couldn't just check AccuWeather or the Weather Channel to see when a storm was coming, and they get caught in a storm. And here's a good rule of thumb. If you're ever on a boat and you're surrounded by professionals, professional fishermen, and they begin to panic, well, that's a cue that you should panic too. And in Mark 4, the disciples, especially the fishermen, begin to panic. And Jesus sleeping in the boat. How can you sleep in a storm? And they're, they're panicking, and they're rushing around, and they're trying to bail water, and finally they go wake up Jesus, and they say, how are you sleeping? Are you just going to let us die? And Jesus stands up, and he says, peace, be still. We'll come back to that in just a second. But he also says something else that's so powerful. He says, why are you so afraid? Why do you have so little faith? You see, this crisis revealed something about them. It revealed that they had a lack of faith in Jesus, the one who had the power over uh, sickness, over death, over creation, and over storms. And there, there's also this really subtle point that Jesus makes, but it's so strong when you recognize it. And it's simply this. Just because there's a storm going on around you, does not mean that there has to be a storm going on within you. And he wanted them to just have peace, to be still. And so while it's true that a crisis reveals you, it reveals weaknesses that are within your heart, it's also true that a crisis can reset you. So I want, to, I want us to look at Romans chapter 5 with the few minutes that we have left. Romans chapter 5, because I believe that this text can give us a sense of what it looks like for a crisis to have the opportunity to reset us. Romans 5, beginning in verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace. What's bringing you peace? What in your life is giving you peace? Is it your bank account? Is it your retirement fund? Is it your social media? Probably not. Um, is it other relationships that you have in your life? Is it, uh, is it your job that is bringing you peace? You see, maybe these crises have revealed something about you. Maybe it's revealed that you have placed your peace or you have tried to find peace in things that don't really give you peace. But because there wasn't much of a crisis going on, you didn't really see it. And maybe this crisis has revealed that you have placed your peace in the wrong place. Because according to Paul, the only place that we can find true peace is through faith in God, through Jesus Christ. That's it. And so this is now an opportunity for you to hit the reset button, for you to place your peace in your faith in God through Jesus Christ. Well, he keeps going in verse 2. He says, Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. We stand in grace. I love that line. Boy, our world needs grace now maybe more than ever. There is so much going on and there is so much need for grace. We need so much grace in our relationships right now. We need grace between black people and white people. We need grace between liberals and conservatives. We need grace between Republicans and Democrats. We need grace in our families, in our jobs, in our communities, in our world. We need so much grace. And what's interesting is that the amount of grace that we show seems to be tied to the amount of peace that we have through God 
in Jesus Christ. And what would it look like for the world to say about you, for your, for your family and friends to say about you? What would it look like for the world to say about us as Christians that, man, they are filled with so much grace? That we don't stand on our abilities, that we stand in grace. What would it look like for the world to recognize that we're not standing on being right, that we're standing in grace? Grace is what we need so much right now. You need it in your life. I need it in mine. We need it in our relationships. We need it all throughout our country, our cities, our globe. We stand in grace. Well, Paul continues. He says, verse 3, not only so, but we also glory in our blank. What do you glory in? Maybe it was when you were in high school and your team won the state championship. Maybe you glory in your children. Maybe you glory in making the big sale, closing the big deal, finally getting that promotion. If you want to know what you glory in, then just pay attention to what you talk about, what you talk a lot about. About. That's generally what you glory in. If there's a story or a moment in your life that you tell over and over and over again, it's something that you glory in. But what's so fascinating is what Paul says he glories in. Let's read it again. But we also glory in our sufferings. Now, wait a minute. Sufferings? We don't even have a category for that. Our minds have a hard time comprehending how can I glory in my sufferings. We live in a society that says if anything brings you suffering, it must be discarded. If there is anything in life that is bringing difficulty or resistance, then it needs to be gotten rid of. That relationship needs to be gone. That struggle needs to be removed because life should be easy. But Paul says, no, 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 we glory in our suffering. You see, suffering has this real interesting way of resetting you. It changes the way that you think. I'll give you a couple of examples. Do you remember maybe when you were playing sports, or if you're currently playing sports, you'll recognize this, that you go through a really intense workout, a really hard practice, one of those that you don't know if you're going to survive, but you do. You get through it, and it changes the way you think because the next time you go through something difficult, you've got past experience that says, I can do this. Maybe your marriage survived a really difficult season. I mean, really difficult. It was on the rocks. You didn't know what was going to happen, but you got through it. And it changed the way that you viewed your spouse. It changed the way that you viewed your relationship. If you've ever experienced a near-death situation, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It resets the way that you think. What's so interesting about what Paul says about suffering is that it produces something. You see, when we go through a difficult situation, if we know that it's going to result in something good, then we can generally endure it a little bit more. And isn't it so encouraging that Paul says our suffering produces? I think that's one of the reasons why it can reset the way that we think. But it also provides us this glimmer of hope that what I'm going through is not in vain. Can I just be honest with you? Our country is going through a really difficult time following the tragic death of George Floyd in Minnesota, of Rashad Brooks in Atlanta, of many others along the way. And there has been this call for white Christians and white Americans to open our eyes uh, in our ears, to the revealed weaknesses in our country and even within our own churches. It has revealed the prejudices and the biases that fill many of our hearts, sometimes uh, unknowingly and unintentionally. And we're seeing this call for our thinking to be reset when it comes to American culture, when it comes to race relations, even when it comes to the relationships within our own congregations. There are many that are calling for fellow white Christians and white Americans to open our eyes to systemic racism that fills our countries, even the systemic racism and prejudice that even can fill our churches. And hear me this, hear me on this. I truly believe that God is using many of these crises that we are facing to renew and to reset us, as long as we'll allow Him to. But as long as we desire to rush back to the way things were, we will miss the transforming work that God is trying to do in and through us. Now, please understand this. I don't believe that God caused a worldwide pandemic. 
I don't believe that God calls the tragic death of any individual, but I believe that God can use each situation for His glory and for our good. And I believe that there are gifts that God is giving us through each of these tragedies. One of those gifts is the opportunity to reset to a new normal. If normal was not what we needed, then let's not return to normal. Let's allow God to create a new normal. Let's allow God to use our suffering to produce something new, something worthwhile, something transforming. And if whatever these crises have revealed within you, that if these crises have revealed something within you that doesn't belong, then get rid of it. Allow the Holy Spirit to remove those desires from within you. So Paul says that our, our suffering produces something. It produces perseverance, this never quit mentality, this mentality that I will push forward regardless of the circumstances. And that perseverance then produces character, this I'm not going to change who I am just because I'm going through something really difficult, that I will be who God has called me to be regardless of my circumstances, and that character ultimately produces hope. Make the connection. Suffering produces hope. And that's exactly what our world needs. Our world needs hope, hope of a better future, hope for true equality, hope for the redemption of mankind. I told you a couple of weeks ago, I was watching the news following one of the protests here in Mobile, and I saw a sign, and on the sign it said, no hope for humanity. That's heartbreaking, but it's not true. There is hope. There is hope in Christ. There is hope that our suffering is going to produce something far greater than we could ever imagine. There is hope that our suffering, that your suffering, that the suffering of so many in our world, in our country, in our city, in our own church is not in vain. There is hope that our suffering is at work to produce something far greater than we could ever imagine. Because while a crisis will reveal you, a crisis can also reset you. So what is this current set of crises revealed about you? Seems like 2020 has been the year of crisis, right? We've just simply moved from one crisis to another. And along the way, it's revealed something about each of us. It's revealed something about our country, about our world, about us as individuals. But here's my question for you. What in your life needs to be discarded because it is not bringing you peace and hope? What in your life needs to go because it's actually keeping you from greater peace and hope. See, in the old normal, it was really difficult to recognize what was robbing us of our peace. It was really difficult to recognize what was destroying our hope. But in the new normal, I hope that you can see it clearly. I hope that you can see the need for a reset. Today, today is an opportunity for your life to be reset. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, it says, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. New. If you're looking for a new normal, if you're looking for a fresh start, if you're looking for a reset, you'll find it in Jesus. So if you need a fresh start, then place your trust in Jesus. Confess His name and be baptized into Christ. If you're already a follower of Jesus, you need a fresh start. Won't you reach out to one of us? Send us a message. Give us a call. Let us pray with you. Let us talk with you through that. But we hope that you'll place greater faith and greater trust in Jesus. Because while a crisis can reveal you, it can also be an opportunity for your life to be reset. With today being Father's Day and us thinking about our own fathers, can't help but thinking about my experience as a father. And I remember when I first became a father and my son, my oldest son, Ethan, he was just a couple of months old and he had to have a surgery. And so I remember the day that we woke up early that morning and we took Ethan to the hospital and he's maybe just two or three months old and he had to be put to sleep for the surgery to take place. And I remember us handing him to the nurse 
and the nurse holding him up high on her shoulder, and she turns around, and I remember looking into Ethan's eyes as he has no idea what's going on, and the nurse is carrying him through the doors to go back for his surgery. It was kind of a tough first moment for us as a parent, uh, for our son to go through this pain. But the reason that we were willing to allow him to go through this pain and suffering was because it was for his own good. The surgery was something that he needed. And so we were willing to allow him to suffer a little bit and to experience pain because it was for his own good. God the Father sends his son and allows his son to go through pain and suffering and death, not for Jesus' own good, but he allows his son to go through suffering and pain for my good for your good, for all of humankind's good. He allowed his son to suffer, not because his son needed it, but he allowed his son to suffer for everyone else. In 1 John chapter 4, John says this, says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And then in verse 10, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. What an amazing thing that God the Father did is that he sent his son, not for his son's own good, but for our good. And he sent his son son, as a sacrifice for us. As we take this Lord's Supper, as we prepare our minds and think about the sacrifice that was made for us, that the Father made for us, that the Son made for us on the cross, uh, let's focus on what that sacrifice does for us and how it allows us to be forgiven of our sins. Let's bow together as we take this bread. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. And we're thankful for the sacrifice that was made on the cross for our sins. God, as we spend this time reflecting on how meaningful that is, I hope that we're motivated to live for you each day. Let's be reminded of how amazing that sacrifice was as we take this bread together. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's pray together as we take the cup. Lord, we're so thankful that you sacrificed your son on the cross, uh, that the blood was shed, and that that blood washes over us and forgives us of our sins. We are thankful for that. And this reminder is a blessing uh, as it helps us as we start this new week. We love you, God. We're thankful for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today at Regency. We're so glad that you've been with us. If you've got any questions or if you need anything, please let us know. Send us an email, call the church office, reach out to us through our Facebook page or through our website. We're so glad that you've been with us today. So just to give you an update on some things that are going on, uh, we are currently meeting on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. And if you feel comfortable and would like to, we would love for you to join us for an in-person for an in-person worship gathering, Uh, but if you need to, we encourage you to continue to engage in online worship, something that we're going to provide to you for the foreseeable future. Uh, Beginning on Sunday, June 28th, we look forward to uh, worshiping in our auditorium. Uh, That will be our first Sunday back in our auditorium since the uh, end of February, and so we're looking forward to that. We know that's going to be a great moment as we get to see all the renovations that have been done. We're excited for you to be able to see those think you're going to really like what you see, but it's also going to be great just to meet in that gathering place where we have met for so long and we long to be again. Also on Sunday, June 28th, we look forward to uh, restarting our children's Bible hour during our Sunday morning worship. Uh, that's uh, for those that are ages 2 years old through about the 4th grade. Uh, we're going to provide that for those children, and so if that is the age of your children, we hope that you'll be back with us and that your kids will enjoy that time together. And tentatively, on Wednesday, July the 8th, Wednesday, July the 8th, uh, we are looking to uh, 
starting back our Wednesday night midweek gatherings. Not exactly sure what all that, that's going to look like right now, whether that's just going to be one main gathering or with children's classes. We're still working on that, but we know that Wednesday, July the 8th, is the target date for when we're going to kick back off our Wednesday night gatherings. We've been in the middle of our summer series, and so we look forward to having our summer series speaker for that week actually speak to us in person. If you have not checked out any of those messages, I hope that you will. You can find them on our website. You can also find them on our YouTube channel. We'll put a link in the description of this video. Hope that you'll check those out. They've been super encouraging. This past week, Tyler Gilreath from the Gulf Shores Church of Christ uh, spoke to us and gave us a very compelling message from 1 Chronicles 4 in, in a short prayer uh, from someone named Jabez. I think you'll find very interesting in this coming week. Rick Whittle uh, from the Spanish Fort Church of Christ is speaking to us, and I know he's got a great message as always lined up for us. So if again, if you need anything, please let us know. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to pray for you, and then we'll, uh, we'll end this video. God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to worship together today. Father, thank you for each person that is joining us online. And Father, I pray for those that are joining us online. I pray that they know that they're still joining us in person. Father, that we're all worshiping you together. That whether our worship is coming forward at 10 a.m. or at whatever time of the day on Sunday, God, we just thank you that collectively, together, we can praise your name, even from different places and even all around the world. Father, thank you for the opportunity to find a reset. Father, I know that crisis can reveal us, but that it can also reset us. Father, I pray for our world. I pray for your peace to come over our world. I pray for grace in our relationships. I pray for grace in our communities. Father, I pray that the different situations that are going on will strengthen our relationships with each other, that, Father, our humanity will grow, our love for each other will grow, and that ultimately your glory will be seen, that your love will be experienced. Father, the world will know us, will, that they will know that we are yours through our love for each other. So, Father, help us to live this day and each day with greater love, greater faith, and greater grace. Thank you, Father, for loving us. And it's in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.